So we will now turn uh, to the second part, which is uh, a more practical, hands-on, and I would say a technical uh, part where we will discuss, you know, a lot, a lot of issues around how to increase the resilience. And this is not only for journalists. I think we, um, you know, uh, all can stand more cyber hygiene in our lives. It's it's really a topic that is oftentimes uh, unpopular because it, it does not make the, the the headlines. But you know, cyber hygiene in the way uh, we we think about it is absolutely key in in ours, our even our work. I know your work, and it, it's it's really key to our resilience. So we can actually do the, the work we're doing um, in a confidential way, and and. Uh, that we actually do not re-victimize victims we're sometimes working um, with. So we have uh, three uh, wonderful speakers for the second part. I'm, I'm personally very much looking forward to it. So first we will hear uh, from Anthony Cave, who is GCA Craig Newman, Newmark Journalist Scholar. Um, Anthony has worked in actually uh, reporting and television for a couple of years before uh, joining uh, the Global Cyber Alliance. Uh, I will let him do the introduction of the Alliance and then uh, of the toolkit for journalists. Um, I am a, a veteran of the Global Cyber Alliance and I have to say it's a, it's a very interesting organization for those who, you know, if you're not familiar with them, because they actually take the, the guidance um, for different communities on cyber hygiene, and then they make them into practical toolkits. Um, so those who, you know, may not know how to implement what they are told to implement, you know, they provide them in a, in a form of toolkit, but I don't want to steal uh, Anthony's thunder. So uh, after Anthony, then we will have two other wonderful speakers. Uh, we will have Dr. Suela Dreyfus, who is a researcher and senior lecturer at the University of Melbourne. She is focusing in her research on cybersecurity and digital privacy and the impact of technology and whistleblowing among other topics. And um, she is the founder and an executive director of an international NGO that supports freedom of expression called Blueprint from Free Speech. And uh, Suelet also worked as a journalist um, for major daily newspapers. So she understands really well uh, the, the ins and outs of reporting. And, and with Suelet, we'll have another presenter uh, who is Eric Johnson. And he spent about 30 years implementing independent journalism, strengthening policies and advocating for progressive media and internet policies and focused on uh, on improving the cybersecurity of journalists and rights activists. Um, so we first uh, turn over to Anthony and after his presentation, it will be over to Suelet and Eric. Um, if there are any questions about, um, you know, about any part of the presentation, again, please raise your hand. We'll, we'll try to pause and, and stop um, or please feel free to ask them at the end. So uh, over to you, Anthony, and thank you for joining us today. Sure, and thank you for that introduction. Does, does the first, does everyone hear me okay? All good? Okay, all right. So a little bit about Global Cyber, Global Cyber Alliance. We're a nonprofit focused on, you know, mainly making sure the internet is trustworthy. I mean, we not only, not only stateside, we have, you know, we, have, we also have an office in Brussels and we have staff, staff in Europe as well. So uh, as Claire mentioned, so we have our journalist toolkit. We also have a toolkit for uh, small business and for elections officials as well. So I, I guess first, you know, from my perspective, you know, I'll talk about what I've seen recently. And there's been a lot of, for, for, for folks that have, have been followed issued, issues in the United States, but there's been a lot of ransomware attacks on some of these TV companies. Uh, we just had um, our, our, so the second largest uh, TV broadcast company in, in the United States, Sinclair, they were subject to a ransomware attack and they had to, you know, I think they had to do some in-person elements because they couldn't, you know, they couldn't use their infrastructure. So it's really important. Some of these tools in our toolkits, it's really important and practical and hands-on. So I guess, I guess I'll guess put a link first to the toolkit the fact of that throughout the presentation. Uh, so that's our uh, journalist toolkit. And I'm just gonna go through some of the highlights so it's really important, I guess, first off, to know what you have. I mean, for, as a journalist, I, I know for me, it's it's keeping account of what uh, what tools I'm using to talk to sources, whether it's Signal, whether it's, you, you know, we had uh, WhatsApp as a tool uh, on the toolkit before. Um, it's, you know, if I'm using ProtonMail, it's really just 
really important to, to keep account of. Yeah, you know, I, I think any needs to keep a, keep account of what they have, especially reporter talking to sources, uh, especially if they're doing a story. My background is investigative journalism, so I'm talking to sources that have sensitive information. You know, I'm trying to get them to trust me with that information. So if my information is compromised, that doesn't help. That doesn't help anyone involved, especially the source, especially my news outlet. So it's really important to have to take an account for, for your stock, and and obviously. With that said, I mean, it's using common sense things. I mean, you have to have a good safeguarding place. If you're at the airport, you're not going to type in some person. You, I mean, just as, a, just as a rule of thumb, you're not going to type in your bank account information using, you know, uh, potentially compromised airport Wi-Fi, right? So it, it's, it's common sense things like that. If I'm, you know, if I'm working from the field, I'm on my VPN at all times. I mean, that's important. Um, especially when I'm sending emails back and forth or, or, or what have you. And by the same time, it also, also, you know, you, you also want to back up and recover your information, right? Um, if, if you're, if, if you're, if your software is up to date or have, you know, you have that little tab in the bottom of the corner that hasn't been updated in you know, a year or what have you. I mean, you really have to take the time to, to do those manual updates or set automatic updates for yourself, right? So you have, um, so again, so your infrastructure is secure when you're reaching out to sources. It's really important. Um, and I mentioned, I mentioned also encrypting your data, right? So I, I've used Signal in the past. I, I know a lot of investigative journalists use um, Proton Mail. I have, a, I have a friend at the Washington Post that they do. They, they do a lot of Proton Mail when they're talking to, you know, sensitive stuff um, or they're doing sensitive stories related to uh, you know, national security in Washington D.C. Um, another th another thing is yeah another thing is also um, you know keep keeping I, I have I have one friend who's a reporter in Phoenix Arizona he has everything he's always he's always afraid of getting fired for some reason even though he's you know he's a national award winning reporter but he has everything on an external hard drive from the past seven years and connected to his main computer so he has that you know sort of like a not an apocalypse kit, but he has it prepared just in case, you know, someone, if he gets subpoenaed for something, he has that, you know, uh, secure. So that's really important. You know, that's just a safeguard that he has in place, but it, I just use that as an example because, you know, as we've seen with the ransomware attacks just recently here in the States, I mean, if your information is compromised, you need to have that paper trail backup. Um, so that's really important. So. And, and also, um, as I mentioned, you know, we have all the toolkits, we have small business and uh, elections. And th those, those are as the same kind of workflow with, with the toolboxes. And, and I encourage you to take a look at that as well. So if you are a small business owner or you're an election official and, you know, maybe you have constituents that have questions or, or folks that have, maybe, maybe there's, there's tools that your small business might need to, uh, to beef up its security, that's really important. And, you know, I, I, I think ransomware is kind of the flavor of the month now, but all these elements are important, right? I mean, not just not just protecting yourself against that, but just how you communicate with people, um, making sure your defenses are updated, make sure, um, you know, making sure that you take account for everything that you have is really important. And, you know, I talk kind of fast, so if anyone has questions, please let me know. Um, but, you know, since I've been with GCA, it's really been about breaking things down into layman's terms. Um, I just did a piece with the uh, California Office of Election Cybersecurity. They just had a recall election uh, back in September with their governor. So they kind of talked to me about some of the things that they're seeing, how they're preparing and how they're constantly, how their workflow is always changing, right? Because, because cybersecurity is always changing. So you can't, I mean, you could have a workflow, but you, you know, I mean, chance always favors the prepared, right? But Threats are constantly evolving. Um, the things they're seeing, you know, the, the disinformation from bad actors they're seeing is constantly evolving. Um, so it's really just being mindful. And obviously, if you are acknowledging something, it kind of gives it credibility. And at least that's some of the problem with disinformation in the states with some some of the uh, cybersecurity concerns. So you could have a intentional bad actor, right, that tweets out, or maybe it's a bot or something that tweets out um, disinformation about in this case, the uh, California election office, right? Um, so I talked to them about really, they kind of have a, a, a scale of what they what they choose to address. Because if you address something that's, you know, low hanging fruit, 
that may feed some of those um, conspiracy theorists and folks in those dark holes that um, that might see that might see that claim that claim of misinformation is credible because you're you're addressing it. So that's another problem we're seeing here in the U.S. is knowing not only the disinformation, but knowing what disinformation to tackle, right? Because if you tackle it, you're sort of giving it credibility, even though you're trying to dispel it, um, if that makes sense. So it's it's a tricky line to balance, um, you know, not only with disinformation, but with cybersecurity. So um, yeah, thankfully, I haven't been the subject of any hacks, but I've seen a lot of um, you know news organizations, um, you know, journalists I work with that have been subject to that, and I've had to sort of go back to that, you know, classic, um, you know, 1990s reporting, you know, pen and paper, uh, uh, especially if they don't have other things digitized on their, on their own front. So, yeah, I think that, um, I don't know if I went a little faster, but any questions so far? Thank you, Anthony. I mean, perhaps it would be helpful just to, if you can share your screen uh, for a couple of minutes to to show the the toolkit and just the way you know it's being set up. I think it's very helpful for for people to see and understand how you know to what extent actually can be practical you know tool for journalists, but also I think even for you know for individuals who you know oftentimes we have our work cybersecurity and security you know really well taken care of and then i think we get a little sloppier in 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 our at least i do unfortunately in our personal um life and devices so i think it would be just helpful to spend um a couple of minutes on that and um if there will be no questions we will uh we will then turn to to swell it and Wetland and eric for um for the next part sounds good so I will go ahead and share my screen now. Okay, does everyone Yeah, so, so kind of what I was going through and and I didn't mention this earlier, so thanks thanks for bringing it up. So we actually have a uh, training portal through Totem um, that's specifically designed for journalists to um, to go to kind of walk through their inventory and what they have as far as tools. So I, I mentioned some of these um, before I shared my screen, but like I mentioned, it's important to know what you have. Um, you know, identify your devices, uh, identify the applications you're using. Like I mentioned, and making sure those things are updated, right? Because you could have, uh, for example, Signal on your phone, but maybe you're you haven't updated it in six months, right? So, so that message to that source um, may not be as secure. Um, and then we also have, uh, I also didn't talk about this, but but obviously I think I think this is coming becoming more prevalent now, but uh, two-factor authentication with, with passwords. I mean, not only for, journalists need this, not only for their, you know, not only for the email, things like that, but also Facebook. Instagram, some of those social media tools that bad actors could compromise. That's really important to, um, especially now with some of the concerns we're seeing with some of these, you know, social media companies, at least in the States, it's really important to have two-factor authentication uh, with your passwords. But even if it's something, even if you only use Instagram, you know, to share food photos, I mean, if someone hacks your Instagram um, and you're an outfacing, you know, member of a media organization, you you know, that's not good. I mean, depend, even if you use uh, something like Instagram for more personal things as opposed to professional things, right? Um, and then you know, we also have tools for, 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 for antivirus software and DNS security. Um, there's, a, there's a couple things there, but, but like, that's kind of like what I mentioned earlier with updating your defenses, right? You want to make sure that you have the most up-to-date information, even if it's time consuming, even if it seems burdensome, you know, you're trying to get work done and, and you have a message uh, at the bottom of your screen to, you know, please update this. Uh, I would definitely go ahead and update that, right? Um, and I mentioned, you know, backup and recovering your data as well. Um, you know, I talked about my TV journalist friend and how he has seven years worth of stuff on external audit. That doesn't mean you should do that, but just, just know, you know, it's really important to have you know, a plan B if, if, if all hell breaks loose, right? And, and we have some tools for that there. So I'm, I'm going through this a little quickly, but, but essentially, so we have toolboxes for each one. And then within those toolboxes are obviously the tools corresponding to the uh, toolbox topic. 
So with, um, I'll just go to encrypt your data here. So with encrypting your data, um, you know, I mentioned, so we have a couple tools for that here. Um, Project Get Galileo, BitLocker for Windows, FileVault file vault if you're on a Mac. Um, it's really, yeah, it's really important, uh, like I mentioned, to, to encrypt your data. So you can just kind of go through that there. And probably the, as you know, as a, as a working journalist, probably probably the what I use the most is, is in the communicate early section. So let's go down here. Yeah, so Signal is, like I mentioned, it's pretty much the standard, I think, for and we had a lot of protests here in the U.S. last summer, and a lot of a lot of journalists that I talked to, they used Signal when they were out um, out reporting in the protests, um, just because it was secure. It was a way for uh, editors and managers to talk to their journalists in the field. That and what was tricky there is that you know depending on security, and that actually dealt with physical security, but um, they would use Signal so so they wouldn't be so not so just to protect themselves you know in that space uh, just because there was a lot of attacks during those protests on journalists um so it was, it was really important to have uh, a tool like this where it was secure and you know as a, as a way to not only protect their their cyber security well-being but their physical security well-being as well and, and signals is still you know pretty popular so, so when you go into a one of our toolboxes, we have you know like these little drop downs, like chapters. So there's Signal, there's Proton Mail, like I mentioned, um, and we're constantly trying to add and update new tools. Uh, we had a dis discussion recently over Proton Mail because I think I want to say the Swiss government they sub subpoenaed um, someone's Proton Mail account and they actually had to give up give up the emails. So we're always trying to talk about. You know, if, if a tool gets mentioned, you know, we're we're analyzing that. We're looking at, okay, well, I mentioned WhatsApp earlier, right? I mean, I think they updated their privacy policy um, recently because we used to have WhatsApp as a tool on here, and we took it out because it just just wasn't uh, secure after they updated their privacy policy. So, I think being transparent and and you know recognizing that you know we're in this space that's something everything's changing all the time, so it's really important to uh, address that as it comes up, right? So if there's a tool that uh, that isn't secure anymore, or we think is not secure, as an as GCA as an organization, we're going to discuss that. Um, you know, we always have meetings talking about new tools, uh, um, and there's ways to obviously submit a tool that for consideration as well, so that we can also talk about that. So that's that's about it for, for me. I'll go back to the homepage here just so you could and take a look, but it's very interesting to go through it, uh, do the training poll that I mentioned. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much what, what I think. Yeah, thank you, Anthony. We actually have a couple of um, couple of questions. Uh, you know, I think that that we uh, we could address and, you know, I would also invite um, uh, Eric and Suella to reflect on those if you would like to contribute um, to discussion. You know, the, there was a question for, from Nick to to you, Anthony, to, to you know, how, how do you know that, you know, you have not been, uh, you know, successfully, you know, I think uh, there's so many, I'm, I'm even looking for the right right terminology, you know, uh, breach or that, that your system have not been accessed one way or the other. Um, you know, there is a way to know if your email has been a part of a part of the a, a data breach, but that's just one thing, you know, someone can be sitting there without you knowing it. So would you like to take that question? How would, how would you know? And, and, and uh, Eric and Solid, please, uh, please come in if, you, if you'd like to on that as well. Anthony. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I don't know. I mean, I could, I could have been, I mean, I've been a working journalist for about 10 years now. I mean, there, there could be many one instance, one instance, three instances of, of a cyber attack. Um, you know, that that's the scary thing, I think, about cybersecurity. We never know the scope or the scale of, of an attack or who it affects or who it doesn't affect, right? So that's why I think these tools are so important to just, just to have those safeguards in place, because if that way you're, you know, like I mentioned, chance favors the prepared. So if you if you have that backup or if you make if your VPN is secure, 
you, you're mitigating some of that risk. Um, and that's really important, I think, in this space, as I'm learning in this space, so. So I see a second question on disinformation here. Yeah, um, you know, so yeah. The question is really, and 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 Eric has provided some some interesting points there. You know, how do you know how do you handle um, you know disinformation if you know your advice is not you know not to um, not to promote it uh, by reporting on it. It's funny. So, so I, I used to be a fact checker for political fact, fact. So they, they do some political fact checking here in the states, and I used to get heat from all sides all the time, right? From the people I was fact checking, from uh, our our consumers, all of the above. Um, and it and it just got to a point where, you know, it's, you still have to put the information out there if you're dispelling a claim of disinformation, but just knowing that there's going to be pushback from all sides and being okay with that, right? I mean, I remember one fact check I did near the sheriff's office and they weren't happy about it. They put it all over their Facebook page, right? So I had to deal with that disinformation plus the, plus the, uh, our media consumers are already wary of fact checking. Um, especially here in the United States, I mean, there's, everything is very um, high partisan now, like, you know, our, our election are contentious all of the above so you know it's still important to address um but i'm just saying that if you're constantly facing my point was if you're constantly facing disinformation you kind of have to know what to tackle right because if you're you know i don't think anyone has the time to address a tweet every 30 seconds right so maybe it's a maybe there's a really big viral claim going around on Twitter and that's the thing you, you would choose to attack as opposed to, to the little tweet from two o'clock in the morning from some bad actor, right? So it, it, you really have to be, you really have to pick and choose what disinformation you address, at least in my experience as a journalist, just because there's so much out there that I can't address, but just knowing what, what I want to tackle and knowing that pushback is going to come regardless, right? And um, I had to accept that early on as a fact checker, just, just even from the folks I was fact checking, they were, they, maybe they weren't happy with how I fact checked the claim or what have you, so. Thank you, Eric. Uh, so that would you like to uh, reflect? I, mean, I know you've, you're helpfully uh, including quite a lot in the chat, which makes it easy then for, for people to copy and paste it and keep it. Um, but if you want to add anything to, to that before we turn to you, um, that'd be appreciated. I think Eric's going to jump in first and I'll come in after him. Well, I, I generally sort of said what I had to say there in the in the chat window. If anybody's not looking at that, make sure to take a look. And um, if you want to, certainly copy and paste it. it goes away after the the uh, session is over, in my experience. So take what you want. Um, but Anthony hit the important points, and and the most important point is just that there are some things that are really, really, really important. And in our cybersecurity business, I do a lot of cybersecurity training. It's really easy to list long group of things that would be good. And it's really fun to do that as an instructor because it shows how smart I am. And I have all these, you know, special uh, words that I'm gonna use in terms of encryption and all that good stuff. But but, but the, the, the upshot is there are only a couple of things that are really, really, really important. And if we can just get people to do those things, then that makes you the person who did those things, who got your software updated and got your accounts to be well defended, that makes you not the slowest gazelle. And the bad guys, the attackers, they're going to go after the slowest gazelles. You don't have to be the fastest. You don't have to be the best. You don't have to be perfect. You shouldn't strive for perfection. You just need to take care of these really important things. Thank you, Eric. I, you guys have said it all in one. <laughs> all right. I don't think I can add much to that. Thank you. And there was one one other question, um, you know, if, if anyone would, would like to take that on, you know, and I actually know from the history of this toolkit that this was discussed many times. Um, Anthony, the question was, do you have something for VPN shut down social media ban and, and blocked for journalists? You know how I know the the um, the toolkit doesn't, you know, uh, wouldn't be able to address it, but are there any, you know, are there any best practices? Maybe you've you've heard or, or share, um, Eric. So let's say, you know, how 
what can one do you know in, in this situation um well that's tricky i know there's tools that where you could so if you're I, I did a session on this recently so if you're docs there's way to there's a way to like pay to remove um sort of scrub your information from the internet as, as best as possible as best as possible i know that doesn't answer the question exactly um hmm. social media ban and block from journalists that's kind of tricky um hmm. i'll have to think on that i don't really have yeah, and I, I know I know for experience if you're docs, there's there's ways to just scrub yourself from the internet so you don't get you're not subject to further cyber attacks. But as far as once you're that's probably the only way I can think of that can mitigate some of that. Um, but as far as being actually banned from social media, that that's that's up to the platforms. I know for me, um, it's weird because sometimes you might find yourself, I think I, I got suspended from Twitter. I don't know why I ended up getting verified after. So it was weird, um, for like a week. I, I, I never got a reason. It was just, it was just something that happened. So it, yeah, it's really up to the, I think to the social media companies that kind of, they're kind of their own police, which is good and bad as we both know. So, um, yeah, I, I know that doesn't answer it directly, but that that's sort of my thinking. Thank you, Anthony, and, and thank you, um, you know, for for everyone's questions. Um, so, last but not least, um, Eric Stewart, over to you. I, I know you already shared a wealth of 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 you know your your in, you know input on on this in in the chat, um, but you know, pl please uh, please continue. Go for it, Eric. Do you, do you want uh, you or me first? So, me, okay. It's your first. Uh, share screen here. So um, I've done a lot of uh, workshops for journalists on uh, cybersecurity, and generally I focus on the topics that Anthony talked about because I find that those are the ones that are the most important, but I didn't want to duplicate what Anthony had today. And so um, what uh, Sulet and I have chosen to do is to talk about anonymity today, which is sort of like a subset of the cybersecurity th thing. Or, or it's sort of like a secondary element of it. But I want to talk about the, uh, the reasons why anonymity matters. So uh, journalists probably should care. Most uh, maybe uh, beginning journalists might not think about it. It's not something that's usually taught in your J school courses. But there are, I think, increasing uh, times when journalists need to think about the anonymity. I think anonymity is probably going to become something that we think about more in the same way that security is something that we now think about more. It's kind of hard to think back about 15 years when uh, none of our mobile phones had pins or passwords and none of our PCs had passwords on them. And we just didn't think about these things. And when we were messaging or we were emailing, we just assumed everything was fine. And we didn't realize that everything was being surveilled. And then starting around 2010, we started to think about it. We realized it, we got concerned about it. We started to pay attention. Um, as a result, uh, we got messengers uh, like Signal, which are pretty good. WhatsApp, which is pretty good, I think. Um, basically, any messenger is pretty good compared to communicating unencryptedly. And I think in the same way that 10 years ago, we started thinking about security. Um, now we're going to start thinking about anonymity because we're going to realize that even though now what we say is generally moderately safe with all these messengers, the information about who's talking to whom is a bigger vulnerability than we realize. Um, it's uh, it's something that you can you can once you start thinking about it and noticing it in the news reports, you'll realize that um, you you know obviously you read about uh, Assange, but let's let's talk about uh, Chelsea Winner. Let's talk about I mean there's just like uh, well let's take right now the court case that I don't know about you, but we're all paying attention to the uh, Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos case. So some of the evidence that's being cite, cited there is SMSs, and you're like huh, I thought my SMSs were pretty good. Well, it turns out all SMSs are recorded by the tele telephone companies and they're all kept and they're all made available to whoever has the right to see them. And that might be uh, in a relatively rich country, it will be the law enforcement agencies, but in a less rich country, it's gonna be anybody who can afford to pay for it. I have gone to a small mobile phone kiosk in a developing country 
and I have offered them $100 to give me all of the SMSs ever sent and received from a certain telephone number, and they have done it for me. So this is, this is a very real threat, and anonymity matters. Um, on my screen, you can see a few uh, thoughts about why journalists need anonymity. I'm going to walk through these four relatively quickly and provide some uh, suggestions for what tools can help. Uh, and uh, I don't know whether you want to try and type this, write this down fast enough if you care, but um, I think I'll certainly share the presentation with Clara and she can share it with participants or put it up on the site. Um, in terms of browsing, you might care because you don't want whoever's watching you to know what you're browsing. If you're a journalist, I think you should assume if you're a journalist that's actually like published, like, you know, you work for any major media or you break stories, I think you should assume that your government is tracking you. And it's not because they're hostile, it's because they're interested in what you're doing. Um, maybe they're hostile too, but at a minimum, it's really important to them to know what you're doing. And at a minimum, that probably means that they are getting a list of every single site that you visit. And you might say, oh, no, I don't think that's likely, or probably it doesn't matter that much. But we who watch these things, who care about these things, we see regularly in court cases now information brought in as evidence about who was doing what online. They really are tracking everything. So for the most part, we probably don't care that much. You might say, well, I'm not doing anything that that's, uh, that's that uh, uh, dangerous. Uh, I was at a conference a year or two ago in which uh, one of the um, yeah, EC commissioners, I think the, I think the for D DG Information Society uh, gave a short talk and <clears throat> she responded to that. Uh, that assertion, I'm not doing anything wrong with the following phrase that I just love. Get a life. We all, we, we all are doing things that we don't want everybody to know about, and we all should be. So um, if you care about everybody tracking what you do, especially your ISP and the government that connects to the ISP and anybody who can get information from the ISP, you can use Tor. Uh, we information security people love to put this in our presentations about Tor. Um, I think most people don't use it all of the time, but it's the kind of thing you should know about and you should be able to turn on when you're researching something that you think is a little bit sensitive. You know, If you're visiting uh, the site of uh, extremist religious organizations, you should probably turn on Tor because you can bet that your government's uh, security services are trying to figure out who's visiting those sites. Um, Tor is the gold standard. There are other applications that help you with this. It's, uh, it's pretty easy to get, download, install, turn on when you need it, turn it off when you don't. Uh, receiving documents anonymously. This is a little bit more technically complicated. It's not the kind of thing that a freelance journalist is likely to be able to do on their own. It is the kind of thing that major media do. If you go looking at any major media, whether the ones listed at the bottom here, New York Times, Washington Post, Liberation, every single one of them is gonna have a site uh, 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 on their site, they're going to have a connection to one of these uh, secure drop boxes. So if you work for a smaller media that doesn't hasn't thought about this yet, it's a good thing to do. Why does it matter? Because you can solicit whistleblowers to drop documents to you. And you do want that because whistleblowers often provide you with your best leak, not leaks, of course, tips, <laughs> leaks too. Um, it, it is pretty important, um, but you do want them to be dropping it to you securely because you can imagine that if you have something on your site that says, please send us information, whoever it is who's in charge of watching these things from your, your government security services is probably gonna be trying to figure out what, who's doing the dropping. And if you say, please send it to me at the email in the footer of this PowerPoint, you can bet they're gonna be watching that email and they're gonna be seeing who's sending to that email. And you don't want your tipsters or your leakers or your reporters or your whistleblowers or your sources to be enumerated by your country's security service. So that's what this secure Dropbox does. You would like to communicate anonymously. Um, if you're in touch with a source and you don't want the source's identity to be um, become become known to your security services, then you can't use a messenger which uh, goes through a centralized directory service. And all of the messengers that you're used to, Skype, Fiber, Line, WeChat, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, even Signal, the gold standard, the very best of the best, they all go through a central directory service, which means that anybody who can see that directory service can see who's talking to whom at a minimum. Now they can't see what, what's being said, but they can see the metadata, who's talking to whom and from when and from where. And uh, again, this is something we're not thinking about a lot right now because we're kind of like, yeah, it probably doesn't matter. Besides who has access to that data, it's kind of hard to get access to it. But this is the position where we were 15 years ago about security, where we, did, we weren't thinking about it. 
but it's increasingly a, a serious issue. Now, okay, Signal, probably pretty safe, right? Because it's managed by Open Whisper Systems, which is a bunch of hackers who are doing really neat stuff to save the world. But it, there is a directory server somewhere for, for Signal. And by definition, the Signal folks have access to it. So when Signal says we cannot share anything, well, it's because they're not recording who's talking to whom via that directory service. But certainly somebody could hack in and see that. And you can imagine that the bad guys or the adversaries or the security services were in principle good guys because they're keeping us safe. But in principle, they're also uh, adversaries for journalists. They should be interested in that and they might be. WhatsApp, obviously owned by Facebook. Obviously, if uh, a government, which shall rename nameless, demands of Facebook that Facebook report on who's talking to whom, that government will get that data. That government uh, probably has mutual legal assistance treaties, MLATs, with a bunch of other governments who are also going to be able to ask for that information. They might even be able to short circuit the MLAT uh, process and get it more directly because there are signatories to the Buddhist Budapest Convention on cybersecurity. So the upshot is, if, if you want who's talking to whom to remain more anonymous, in fact, actually anonymous, you have to use one of these messengers. Um, among these three, none of them are perfect because they're all a little bit rough around the edges. They're all relatively young. None of them have a team of you know, 50 or 100 coders working on them. That's the way WhatsApp does, or even a dozen coders, the way Signal does. But th this would be, uh, I think every, every serious journalist should be working on ensuring that they are on one of these and that they publish their address on one of these. So that if some leaker, whistleblower, tipster, reporter says in your country, I'd like to talk to the journalist, but I'd like to do it securely because I wanna make sure I don't get caught and outed and fired and killed. They should go looking, a good leaker should go looking for a journalist who's using one of these. And most famously, Edward Snowden went looking for a journalist who was able to handle these things. And he had a hard time finding that journalist, right? So he, uh, the, the guy he ended up talking to was not his first choice because all of his first choices were like, oh, I don't know, oh, I don't think that's important. I don't care about that. I'm not publishing my address. Now a good journalist will put this information on their page. Here's my session address. Here's my ricochet address. Uh, finally, publishing anonymously. This is probably not something most journalists need to do because after all, if you're a journalist, you're publishing in a medium a newspaper, a television station, a Substack newsletter, whatever, which you want to monetize. So as you see in the bottom of this slide, you, you need to be able to somehow be public in order to get money. You could say, well, I'm going to publish anonymously, and then I'm going to put my you know, Patreon link here so that people can send me money. But it's pretty easy to imagine that the FBI is going to be able to get in touch with Patreon and say, who owns that account? And they're going to have that credit card information, and then they're going to get in touch with you. So um, it is uh, pretty hard to publish anonymously if you actually want to uh, be able to get money from it. But um, it is possible. Um, WikiLeaks is sort of the, the gold standard. Pastebin is another one that's often a place where people will drop information. Uh, you can set up your own dark website if you want under a dot onion um, uh, moniker, which means that it could only be seen within Tor. Um, what's the problem with anonymity? I mean, of course, it has downsides. Uh, we know that governments are not too happy about anonymity because they believe that it's probably um, harboring or hiding um, truly bad stuff. And it's true, it is. It's the same way as, let's say, a gun. It can be misused. Um, China is working very hard to make sure that there is literally no anonymity. Um, a lot of other governments are edging in that direction. So there's something to be said for, uh, for us trying to make sure that we uh, use, those, use these tools to preserve anonymity and we make sure that our policy advocates, our representatives, um, somehow prevent our governments from uh, eating into the small space for anonymity that's left. Um, I don't have a lot of hope for any major policy changes, but as long as these tools continue to work, we've got a little bit of space. And finally, I just added this slide as Anthony was speaking. So this is sort of my summary of the things that, that he was talking about. These bullet points are, are things that he said. So there's nothing new here um, other than these percentages. So um, you saw me mentioning in the chat that I think the priorities are really, really important. And the reason is because it's, it's, it's too easy for us uh, security gurus to say, you have to do the following 25 things. <laughs> and then the journalist we're teaching is like, uh, well, if it's that hard, I guess I'm not gonna try. Or uh, more often they're gonna say, okay, I'm gonna do the thing that's easiest, right? So if I can open up my windows and go to the control panel that's labeled BitLocker, tick a box, and I'm like, yes, I'm good. You are good, that is important, it's worth doing. The problem is it's probably not your weakest point. 
So these these two bullet points at the top at the top I find in my I work with hundreds of journalists and and activists, especially in developing countries, because I'm in the aid business. But in my experience, and I, I hear about some new problem every day from somewhere, whether it's Ethiopia or Iran or East Timor, um, the two big ones at this point are these top two. And that is what I had to share. So look. Yes, hello, okay. Um, I will try and share my screen. Let's just see if I can do that. Yes, I'm able to share my screen. What do you know? Very good. Okay, can you all see that? Yep, do I get some nods? Excellent, okay. I can't see questions in the text in this when I um, have my screen shared, just to let you know, but I won't share the screen for too long. Um, so uh, I, I think, um, you know, anonymity is the, if you will, the important next frontier, um, as Eric was discussing. Just to give you a little bit more background on myself, I, I'm a senior lecturer at University of Melbourne in computing and information systems, and I teach third year students cybersecurity, information, privacy, as well as teaching emerging technologies to master's students. But I also have the pleasure of teaching the investigative journalists in the Masters of Journalism um, program uh, about cybersecurity. And that's something I've brought Eric into as well. And we've been team teaching there, um, as well as teaching journalists through Blueprint for Free Speech's work in this area. Part of the reason that Blueprint does work in this area is we have a wraparound sort of um, philosophy to journalists and whistleblowers, and that is that you defend um, freedom of expression best if you defend all of the points of contact between the source or whistleblower going to the journalist, going to the publisher, going to the public. And if any one of those chains or you know, elements of the chain are broken, then the public doesn't benefit. Um, and so you've actually got to have an intact approach. And that intact approach means you've got to attack it from advocacy and policy, law reform, but also in the technology end um, as well. And so that, that is involved both in training journalists, but also building software like Ricochet Refresh, which we've done. The three things that I really want to talk about today with regard to particularly the focus on anonymity uh, is that the ethics are changing between journalists and whistleblowers. So we wrote uh, something called uh, the Perugia Principles for Journalists a couple of years ago, it was based on sessions that we'd run at uh, the, Perugia, uh, the Perugia Festival, the International Journalism Festival, it's held every year in April in Perugia and is the largest journalism festival in Europe. Um, and we had a round table of investigative journalists from around the world to sit down and work through what needed to be done. But the key element of that change that's that's being done is, is a change from just the journalist, I have to protect my own data and be responsible for my own cybersecurity to, I must extend that umbrella of protection to my sources and to my whistleblowers. I have an ethical obligation to educate them, to protect them and to encourage them because I know from my own research in whistleblowers and I've, I've done more than a decade of academic research in this area, that whistleblowers um, often know even less about it than journalists do. So that's a that's a important transition that is not fully um, hasn't been fully transitioned, but it is a different way of thinking. Um, and I think that started to come and it's very important. And so the importance of teaching tools to journalists is not only teaching those tools, it's also teaching them to teach it to their sources. Um, now that actually leads to a, a second and, and thornier problem. Um, and that is that one of the weakest, the areas of you know, greatest sort of weak point for um, the relationship between journalists and sources, as well as human rights defenders um, you know, and, and others in high risk environments uh, is first contact. There's been a little bit of research in this space, but in my view, not nearly enough. Um, now we know, for example, um, that metadata is a little trail of breadcrumbs that's left when people have contact. It doesn't actually tell you necessarily what the nature was of that contact, just that two people have been in contact. I have, for example, here highlighted the article, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Sterling, um, who was a CIA officer who is described as having a trial by metadata. Uh, he had allegedly been in contact with um, investigative journalist, James Risen, um, and, and Risen was gonna be forced to give up his sources. He refused in the end, the prosecution decided not to prosecute him, but effectively the view is that Sterling is the first whistleblower, at least in a major Western country to be convicted on metadata alone. 
So not having anything more than that electronic uh, breadcrumb kind of trail. So um, first contact means that, you know, if you don't come in via an anonymous avenue, if you don't come in via session, via ricochet, via briar, um, then you have just created a link between the journalist and, um, and the whistleblower. And that's really risky. Um, and so... Uh, being able to actually train journalists to communicate, outwardly communicate, that they need to be talking to people about that before people reach out is really important. One thing that I used to do as a journalist is I would, wherever I could, flag on things like social media when I was going to be appearing in public somewhere. And I would do that quite deliberately, not for self-aggrandizement so much as to actually let people know that I would be somewhere at a, at a particular time and place physically. And I found that context sources would come to me uh, and try and meet me in person if they wanted to share information with me, not over um, electronic uh, sources. So there's a, I, I mentioned this only because a blueprint recently released a report expanding anonymous tipping in Europe. Um, it's the first report really of its, of its type looking at anonymous tipping channels, electronic anonymous tripping channels. And I think one of the relevance here is that we're looking at it through the eyes of the journalist relationship and the journalist source relationship, but actually there are plenty of other uses for this technology that are really important society. And one of them uh, is for, for example, anti-fraud agencies. These are increasingly being used, using technology um, such as uh, global leaks to have sources come to them. And that's being rolled out in places um, uh, such as Italy and Spain quite extensively. So oh, it hasn't had deep penetration in other countries yet, but, um, but Blueprint was part of a EC project um, uh, across almost a dozen countries to try and expand the adoption of that technology. Um, the final thing I just wanna say is that there's a dilemma with anonymity and it's, it's something to do directly with cybersecurity and in a sense, some of the things that we've heard from the speakers in the first part uh, of, um, I was gonna say this evening, cause I'm in Australia, but <laughs> today. <laughs> um, and that is, is that on the one hand, we have automated cybersecurity software which is improving protection, particularly of corporate networks, but not exclusively. Uh, and it's doing that through the use of machine learning and to, to a lesser degree, AI. And that's a good thing, right? And so I'm hearing, for example, I, I bring in penetration testers, so professional hackers into my, my classes to, to talk to students. And what they've been telling me this year is that they see there's an incredible drop-off in the number of what they refer to disparagingly as, quote, fake hackers. And what they mean by fake hackers are uh, people who pretend to be really good at hacking, but are actually really bad at it. Um, and it turns out that that ML based software of which there is now an increasing amount of it available in the marketplace uh, is weeding out these hackers pretty, pretty quickly, um, which is interesting. Uh, so that's good in the sense it reduces sort of the threat um, surface for a lot of companies. It's also good um, in other ways. So for example, um, pen testers have to uh, think more carefully. That means that there's, you know, more resources that have to be spent by an attacker in these networks. So typically, for example, in Australia, the pen testers I speak to say that they are for most major clients having to completely build from scratch an exact replica of what they believe the systems are they're going to be attacking. Um, and that this will take on average about six months. So an attack will be run over about six months, sometimes longer. Uh, and, and that the purpose of this complete replica standalone of the system that they're attacking is um, that they need to be able to determine whether or not the ML or AI based systems are actually gonna catch them. Um, and so what they're saying is that typically uh, if they will do something um, the uh, maybe two or three times, it's unsuccessful the ML will pick it up and it drops them into a sandbox silently. They don't know it. Uh, and then from that point on, they're monitored and that's it, game over. So, so this is quite good. This is terrific, in fact, right? We're improving the cybersecurity. But the flip side of that is that the monitoring that occurs of, and the behavioral analytics is making it much more difficult to be anonymous. Right. So that is, in a sense, the threat model that's being reversed, you know, applied to to journalists trying to interact with with whistleblowers or, or other sources. And in fact, I'm part of a new study looking at workplace surveillance on and the work from home era. 
um, that is that is dealing with this and in other ways, you know, other issues of sort of invasion of privacy and what that that changing landscape means. So there are not easy answers to this anonymity dilemma, and we do want all the cybersecurity that comes from it. But the downside is that it then becomes much harder because of these behavioral analytics to shield your identity um, if you are someone who is reaching out to a journalist with a story about corruption. I'll just leave on one um, final uh, anecdote, which um, you know, has been in a sense a personal inspiration to me. Um, Ricochet, we were originally involved in the development of Ricochet and, uh, and then it lay fallow for a couple of years. The main developer went off and did some other things. And, and we decided to pick it up again. And I was really chuffed, uh, a um, investigative journalist who, for whom I have enormous respect from Eastern Europe. Uh, and um, his organization has blown some fantastic stories out of the water. Uh, and he, um, an extended group of journalists from several different um, news organizations reported on a serious international crime ring. Um, unfortunately, one of those journalists uh, died in questionable circumstances. And two of the journalists were brought into the police station and interrogated, but including him and eventually let go. And he said to me that the only reason the source for that story was still alive was because they had been using Ricochet with the source. And I thought, okay, now I know through all the headaches and everything else of, of, you know, of running an NGO and all of the grant chasing you have to do and all the rest of it, that's, yeah. I thought, okay, that's why you get up in the morning. But, uh, but that, that was great. And, and so it really does matter and it really can work. And I'm not saying it's just Ricochet, obviously it could work with Session or, or Briar as well, but it is to show you the importance of that. And that's from the mouths of the people who do the hardcore investigative journalism and organized crime. That's about it. Now I might unshare this and let's see if I can see if anyone's had any comments. No, nope. Eric's just had the comments in the, if I missed any questions, no, fantastic. Okay. <laughs> Charlotte, that was, I mean, that was wonderful. And, and you know, it, it's some of the topics you you have mentioned are are the ones you know I personally and and I'm and I'm not as close obviously as you you did the the issue, but we do work quite a lot with civil society organizations and geos, you know, and we and we try to think about how to help their cybersecurity. But you know, we really look forward to sharing also this with them because some of these issues. Uh, are just as relevant, you know, to, to their work and, and their operations. So I just want to leave, you know, see if there's any questions um, to the speakers we had today. I mean, we had a lot of, uh, a lot of great, um, a lot of great uh, content. I mean, uh, Eric was responding to Nick, you know, how do you know whether you've been, been attacked? And he says, everyone's been attacked. I think the question is whether successfully or not, right? Uh, I think everyone is being attacked is whether they succeed or not is the second question. And, and uh, also, you know, you, some of you may be familiar with, with Dimitri Alperovich, formerly with CrowdStrike, who used to say, you know, there is uh, only two counts of two types of company, those who have been breached and those that don't know about it. So I think this is a little bit, you know, in the, in the, in the same, uh, in the same way. so, you know, if there are no questions uh, right here, right now, I want to give everyone there a bit of a time back. I just want to thank uh, everyone, you know, both the, the contributors and the participants uh, for being so generous with their time. I know uh, two hours in a day is, is a lot. Uh, so uh, again, thank you for, for contributing this content to this discussion. As we mentioned, we, we did record and we're still recording uh, the session, uh, which we will um, use you know, on, on our website and we will share this widely because there was a lot of good content, a lot of good information uh, you have provided today. So uh, if there's no questions, uh, I wanna thank everyone once again and wish them the good rest of their day. Thank you to those who joined from uh, those parts of the world where this was a challenging uh, time of the day and hour. So uh, extra thank to those who have evenings or early mornings. Um, and I look forward to further discussions on, on this topic with you. Thank you.